As we've already noted, the religion created in Babylon by Nimrod and Semiramis is known as the Mystery Religion, or simply the Mysteries. At its core, it was an inverted retelling of the fall of man in Genesis. In the biblical account of the incident, the serpent caused Adam and Eve to sin against God by suggesting they eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge. Because they acted in disobedience to God, who had specifically told them not to eat from that tree, sin entered into the human race and all the misery, disease and tragedy that makes up human history stems from that moment. In the Babylonian inversion of this event, however, the serpent is portrayed as the real good God. He was worshipped for opening the eyes of men and for infusing the woman with his passion and lust. He was seen as a liberator and an enlightener. To them, he illuminated the minds of mankind by revealing to them the secret knowledge that God had tried to keep from them. Look again at the all-seeing eye. Notice that it has rays of light emanating from it. This represents the illuminating secret knowledge that he claims to offer, the secret serpent knowledge that could provide mankind with their own salvation and which would see them become gods. That is why the religion is called the Mysteries, because it claims to harbour the secret knowledge that was offered to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In the Mysteries, the true God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Yahweh, was portrayed as a wrathful deity of hate who was guilty of opposing freedom of choice. Because Nimrod and Semiramis set themselves up as the sun and moon gods, the religion was also based on a corruption of primeval astronomy. It was believed by Noah's righteous ancestors that the stars told the story of Satan's rebellion against God in heaven, his fall, subversion of mankind, the promise of a Messiah who would suffer and die to lift the curse of sin and then be installed as Lord of creation and conqueror of Satan. These stories were widely known amongst the people of the time. Semiramis, however, again inverted the story and so in the mystery version, the stars of the sky told a different story. In the Babylonian version, Satan was depicted as the rightful lord of the universe, whose throne had only temporarily been usurped by God. One day, an antichrist, a seed of the serpent, would be born of a divine mother, would become God himself, replace God, and return rulership of the world to the serpent. Semiramis claimed that this was the real, hidden truth concealed within the stories. This corrupt and satanic version is the origin of astrology, which still exists virtually unchanged today. The Babylonians didn't just believe the stars told the story of the universe, they believed you could divine the future of individuals through them as well. If the stars told the story of things that had passed, they could also tell the stories of things to come. They would therefore divide the sky into sections and give meanings to each section on the basis of the stars that are found there. According to the theory, a person's destiny is said to be determined by whatever section or sign he is born under. This is the origin of horoscopes. In times to come, astrology would pass to the empire of ancient Egypt, which is the place we most associate with pyramids today. The sacred mountain pyramids were constructed with certain mathematical relationships to the stars. The Sphinx also has astrological significance. It has the head of a woman, symbolizing Virgo, the Virgin, and the body of a lion, symbolizing Leo. Virgo is the first sign of the zodiac, and Leo is the last, so the Sphinx, which literally means joining in Greek, is the meeting point of the zodiac indicating that the Egyptian priests believed Egypt was the centre of the universe. By the time Moses led the Jews out of Egypt in Exodus, astrology had also infected the population in Canaan, which was the land that they were headed towards. Hence, some of the strictest warnings in the Bible against astrology date from this period, such as in Leviticus 19.31 and Deuteronomy 18. The biblical denunciations of astrology identify the practice with demonism or satanism in the sense that Satan and his hosts were actually being worshipped in the guise of the signs, planets and stars. And as mentioned previously, the leading lights of the sky, sun and moon, were worshipped in the form of Nimrod and Semiramis. Very significantly, a third leading light was identified in the sky that was 23 times more luminous than the sun and therefore was considered to be the most important star in the sky. 
This star is known as the Dog Star, Sirius, or the Morning Star, because it's still visible even in the morning light. Remember in Isaiah 14.12, Lucifer is referred to as that name. When allied with the sun and moon, the morning star completes an unholy trinity of lights personified in Satan, Nimrod and Semiramis. One of the key elements of the mysteries that I also want to emphasize is the hierarchical structure that they contained. The secret illuminating knowledge from the serpent was not to be freely distributed to the unworthy. You would have to become initiated into the religion and then work your way through ascending degrees of revelation and knowledge. This ascension through the levels was considered to be a journey from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, a process of enlightenment. Progression was propagated by a hierarchy of priests and priestesses and were marked by fearful rites of passage and oaths of secrecy, which, if broken, would lead to death. Similar oaths of secrecy are sworn today by other hierarchical institutions like the Freemasons and Jesuits, but more about them later. The further along in the process you were, the more enlightened you were considered. The more enlightened you were, the more you could look down your nose at the unenlightened. The hierarchical structure of the mysteries was designed to create inequality amongst men based on what they knew. It can itself be best visualised in the form of a pyramid or ziggurat again, wide at the base and increasingly narrow as you rise through the levels towards the peak. The idea is that there is an average mass of people at the bottom of the pyramid who are ignorant blind fools with an increasingly small number of enlightened people towards the top. The very top, the capstone as it were, is Lucifer himself, the giver of light. If you've read or seen Harry Potter, you'll be vaguely familiar with this concept. In those stories, the name Muggle is given to the majority of people in the world who go about their lives utterly oblivious to the wizarding world that is actually all around them, or at least very close at hand. We are encouraged to think of Muggles as idiots, and indeed the Oxford English Dictionary has even picked up on the word and defines it as an individual who is clumsy or unable to acquire a new skill. Those who were born into a muggle family but have been awakened to wizardry are called mudbloods, i.e. half-bloods, and this places you on a higher position than a muggle, but a lower position to those who have centuries of pure wizardry in their ancestry. J.K. Rowling here, as in many aspects of her books, is actually giving insights into real occultism. The word occult means hidden or concealed, and it is the modern name by which the ideas of the mysteries have come to be known today. When you have people involved in the occult, the information, knowledge and power that they are trying to tap into is the exact same as that serpent knowledge which originated in Babylon. The idea of occultism retains the concept that there are a powerful, enlightened or illuminated few at the top who see things as they really are and the rest are kept in the dark, mere ignorant fools. The enlightened few consider the average mass of people to be almost subhuman like cattle, who deserve to be led like cattle and treated like cattle. This knowledge hierarchy is replicated in almost all occult societies today, like Freemasonry for example, and it fulfills an important function of allowing Satan to pervert by small degrees. Those at the lower levels of Freemasonry have absolutely no idea of what they are actually involved in. It is only as they slowly rise through the degrees that they have the true information revealed to them. By perverting in small stages and in the passing of time, people lose sight of just how far they're straying and can be led to accept things that they would otherwise have flatly rejected if they had been given the full revelation from the start. Just a little change here, a little change there, it's not so much. And yet with enough small changes and with enough time, a person or society can be completely transformed without even realising it. This is one of the reasons why we must have a zero tolerance policy with sin. The concessions we make today will form a link in a chain of concessions in future if we're not careful. This kind of system that needs to keep knowledge concealed from the masses, by its very nature, necessitates the use of symbolism, gestures, monuments, secret words and signs to ensure that those in the dark are kept in the dark. That's why the occult makes heavy use of these devices. They use symbols that are packed with meaning for the initiated, but which mean absolutely nothing to the average man. 
By using symbols, information can be communicated by being hidden in plain sight. That is, they are in the open air for all to see, but they are not recognised or interpreted by the average person. It is also for this reason that the occult always hides behind outward facades of neutrality, goodness or even holiness. I mentioned this earlier, but don't expect evil to have an obvious outward appearance of evil. That's not how Satan wins people to himself. More often than not, he disguises himself as an angel of light to seduce, which is why discernment becomes one of our most important tools in these last days. It is also for the same reason that dual meanings are prevalent in the occult world. Wherever there is a dark infernal truth to be communicated, there is almost always a false but light and seemingly good cover story. The public are given the false cover story in order to keep the dark truth concealed. The initiated and the enlightened only are aware of the true meanings. By using the system of double speak and deception, occultists can speak a sentence containing words which mean something to fellow occultists but which mean something very different to the average person. Bernie Taupin, Elton John's lyricist, is reported to have once said that he never wrote a single song that wasn't written in this doublespeak. The average listener hears Elton John's lyrics and either doesn't discern a message at all or thinks they discern a light and wholesome one, while in reality they are telling quite a different message to the initiated. Closely related to this concept is the idea that light and darkness emanate from the same source, Nimrod and Semiramis were the sun and the moon, the leading lights of the day and night, but they were two separate manifestations of the same source, Satan. So the idea is that there is one force which has a light masculine side and a dark feminine side. If you've seen Star Wars, you'll be familiar with this concept. The force is considered neutral, but can be used for good or evil. Or what about the Wizard of Oz, where it's explained that there can be good witches or bad witches? This is key to occultism. The power is neutral, it's how you use it that counts. And speaking of songs with double meanings, Bernie Taupin also of course wrote the lyrics to a Wizard of Oz related song, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. The Wizard of Oz has an occult message that we'll get to later. But these are themes that have infiltrated our culture, and these are some of the key telltale signs of satanic mystery religion. Look out for them as we continue our journey. A final feature of the mystery is was its absolute obsession with sex, and this is again something that carries on into modern occultism. Because of Sammy Ramis's history as a brothel keeper, we should be unsurprised to find sexual perversion playing a huge role in her religion, and that indeed is what we do find. Worship of both male and female regenerative parts, but particularly the male phallus, played a key role. There was ritualistic sensual dancing, sacred prostitution and sodomy with male and female prostitutes. Sex was seen as an act of worship and was encouraged in all its most perverted forms. The religion was also notable for its vicious blood rituals, where animals and children were brutally sacrificed. Because sex was involved in the worship, unwanted babies often resulted and they were sacrificed on the altar of this depraved system. The religion also involved the use of magic, conjuring, channeling and sorcery. In fact, the worship in the religion involved the most vile and evil forms of immorality imaginable.